恭敬大德圣体为此发挥及一切众生请转妙法论教导我们不和聊生托斯离苦得了素真无生。Will the Sangha with great virtue out of compassion for the sake of this assembly and all living beings, please turn the wonderful Dharma wheel to teach us how to leave suffering and attend bliss and end birth and death and quickly realize non-birth. Namu tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Namu tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Homage to the blessed, noble and perfectly enlightened one Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Namo saranto suchedoye olahudi sammyao sanputoshe. Namo saranto suchedoye olahudi sammyao sanputoshe. Ushang shen shen wei niao fa. Bai qian wan jie nan zao yu. 我今天闻得受持,愿皆如来真实意. Supreme and wondrous Dharma, subtle and profound, rarely is encountered, even in millions of eons. But now we hear it, see it, and expect it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Venerable Master, Dharma friends, welcome. Good evening. This is... Saturday night, November 2nd, here in Berkeley, California, we're about to look into the Flower Garland Sutra. And tonight's a special night, auspicious night. We're starting the 10th ground, the 10th stage. This is a, a landmark for me personally and maybe for the Avatamsaka Sutra in, in English in the West. People haven't cracked open this text at this point, maybe before. Uh, Master Shenhua did it uh, in Chinese, and uh, we're following in his big footsteps and using his, uh, following the, the trail he blazed to continue to explain this text for, for folks who uh, are curious about Flower Garland Sutra, about the Bodhisattva path. That's what this talks about. So uh, let's do it. Let's get started. And you've got a text in front of you. Here on the text is a, this is actually an invocation. It's a, a chant that we're going to do. And as we do it, the idea is we're inviting the speakers of the sutra, the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas who brought this text to, to us originally, way back 2,500 years ago, and uh, saying to them, we honor you, would you like to please come and witness what we're doing? So, invisibly, spiritually, we hope that happens. So it's up to us to be sincere, and then that's our part. That's the pitch, 
That's the melody. Here we go. Nam mô đa phang quang phu hoa yên trì Hoa yên hai vệ ô phu sa Nam mô đa phang hoa yên trì Hoa yên hai vệ ô phu sa that again. What do you say? Mm. All right. Sounds like a pipe organ with strings. So this is our first night looking into the tenth stage. Here it is. It's a skinny book so far because we're starting fresh. And we give you, every time we upgrade these books, we give you as much as I've translated. So the actual uh, finished English chapter, uh, finished English translation of this chapter doesn't exist yet. This, this is it so far, uh, which is exciting because you all, we all, are part of the chemistry that creates this. And we're, uh, our teacher first opened this text back in the early 80s. Actually, no, I take it back. It was this, the late 70s. 76, 75, 74, 75, 76, around then. And we published it in the early 80s. And, you know, 30 years have passed, 40 years have passed now. And we're, uh, our understanding of what this, what's going on has progressed. And our ability to translate, our familiarity with Chinese language, and how... Uh, how this sutra connects with our lives has progressed. So our translations are improving as we go. And we, it's, it's obviously, it's a work in progress. We, we get better as we do it. But the point to make is that uh, it's just us. There's no other experts, there's no other adults in the room who, who say, oh, finally you've got it right. right. It's just us. And as much as you all Question, challenge, uh, think about and then ask about. As much as you do that, that's how, how good, how accurate, how useful our translations are to your life. Right? So what I'm trying to get at is this is the opposite of a, a typical Asian style of lecturing where the monk sits here and every word that comes out of his or her mouth is golden and you don't challenge it, you don't question. He's what they say, gao gao zai shang. You know, he's up there and the words come from the cathedral. The words come from the Buddha and you just accept it. Uh-uh, that's not the way we do it. That's, that's not uh, the nature of what our teacher, Master Shrinhua, opened for us. He said, this is, uh, these sutras don't come from any outside source. They come from the awakened mind of somebody who looked deep at a quiet place in his mind, the Buddha, 
right? Who was a person who woke up. So, in other words, the source of the sutra was an internal source. Somebody who looked really deeply at his own heart and then reported what he found because his mind was really quiet and key, he had got past himself. The big me that had opinions, that had likes and dislikes and things that he didn't understand about himself, that's all gone. Uh, the Buddha was completely awake to his own stuff, his own games, his own habits, and saw through them. And as a result, just totally connected with the mind that produced the sutra, which is your mind too, once it wakes up. So that's, with that as the, the uh, understanding of what we're doing, clearly no, no one of us is going to own it. Right? This is Hung Shur's interpretation of the Avatamsaka. That would be cheating me and all of you. Uh, we're, all, uh, we're all beginners here, right? We're all, uh, what do they say, amateurs, those who love, right? Amateur, one who loves what they do. We're not making money <laughs> explaining the sutra. My goodness, you guys, you all gave up your Saturday night, you know. Think of the stuff you could be doing on a Saturday night. You came to, to look into a 2,500-year-old book. Couldn't think of anything better to do, huh? So, well, you know, there's something here, especially tonight, because why? Um, I was at lunch today. We, uh, we have this custom of after you all feed the monks, the monks feed you back with, with uh, Dharma talks. And what occurred to me today was to preview what, uh, what you're about to witness tonight, right now. Which is what? It's goddesses talking. What I mean by that is the, the sutra in... Let's see, we've got one, two, three, four... Okay, four stanzas into it. says, and then... the the Tiennu, the Deva women, the Devis, goddesses in heaven, praised the Buddha and said, right, so we're hearing songs from female Devas, Devis, we're hearing songs from goddesses, dwellers in the heavens. And how cool is that? I mean, I, I'm not going to spoil it for you. I'm going to let you decide what you're hearing. But I... I think that's cool myself because uh, I came from a, a Methodist Protestant Christian tradition and there was one God and he was male and he didn't sing. <laughs> he didn't sing. He didn't clap his hands. He didn't ring bells or hit drums or play flutes or harps. He did not. He was God on high and that was, you know, you listen to what he said. Here, there are numerous Davies, they're, they're women, there are lots of them, and they sing. Not only do they sing, they praise the Buddha. And wait, wait till you hear what they say about it. So, I mean, okay, that's interesting. This is a Buddhist sutra with singing goddesses. Right? How cool. That's what it talks about. So, right as we start. And this is all the uh, preamble. This is the preparation for the Buddha to come out and... Uh, say what he wants to say about what's called a 10th stage bodhisattva, an awakened being who's almost ready to become a Buddha. This is uh, the last step in the long, long bodhisattva path before this person, could be a male, could be a female, wakes up themselves, right? So that's, uh, that's what I wanted to say as we get started. We ready? Want to jump right in? Here we go. You got page two. In your text, here it is. We're starting the ten stages. Here we go. Okay, I'll give you a, I'll give you a line in Chinese. You can read along with me. It's Jing Ju Tian Zhong Na Yo Ta, right? That that line. And you're welcome to read the characters if you can. Read the the romanization if uh, if you want to, and or neither one. And look over at the English, which we'll get to right after. Here we go. Jing Ju Tian Zhong Na Yo Ta Wen Si Di Zhong Zhu Sheng Heng 
空中踊跃新欢喜，西宫虔诚供养佛。All right, over to the right. We're going to read it together. Pay attention to the punctuation and the white space. Take a breath where you see the commas. Here we go. The devas from the heavens of the pure abode, nayutas in number, having heard the supreme practices on that stage, danced with delight in the air, their minds filled with joy. With deep sincerity, they made offerings to the Buddha. Okay, now I take it back. It, we start with the gods, and they're dancing. They're not singing; they're dancing. The devas from the heavens of the pure abode. Where's the heavens of the pure abode? That's in the uh, the collection, the the group of heavens called the Brahma heaven. There's 28 levels. And on to、uh, various levels of general, all the way up to five star, and etc., etc. Right? And with each level, their abilities, their privileges, their、uh, their uniforms reflect where they are in that hierarchy. Well, the heavens, the way the Buddha described them, are the same way. What's the criteria for advancing? Is your samadhi. Your ability to meditate, also your blessings, and Master Hua would say, anybody can be born in the heavens. You can, if you cultivate the five precepts and the ten good deeds, you're born in the heavens. But that's the the desire realm heavens, the heaven of the pure abode. And our devas here, they get there through meditation skill. The five precepts and the ten good deeds, which basically are an ethical, that means good behavior. You you live right, right? You're a righteous person. From that foundation, you go on to your meditation skill. If you do good when you meditate, nothing bothers you, right? If you mess up as a human. Selfish, greedy, angry all the time, knocking people down. Then, when you go to meditate, you you can't sit still because all that, all the waves you've stirred up, keep you moving, and you can't sit still. So these are people who sat really still. Oh boy, and still outside and still inside. So they get to the heavens of the pure abode, in the Brahma realm. So, and then it says Nayuta is a number, meaning lots of them. Okay, the devas from the heavens, the pure abode, all these gods, many in number, heard the ninth stage, what we just finished. They were happy. They thought, "Man, I want to do that. I want to cultivate that stuff. I want to learn that and be able to do that. What the bodhisattva can do." And then look at that last line: "Xi gong qian cheng gong yang fu," really sincerely. They made offerings to the Buddha, and、uh, this is something that pops up in these texts over and over and over. Which is one of the things that the sutra says awakened beings do is they're generous. They give stuff. They're always giving, and it says sincerely, chen chen, and that's that's a theme. The higher bodhisattvas go, it seems like the more they 
give to others. If you read the Lotus Sutra, you have Guanyin Bodhisattva, who's, you know, Guanyin Bodhisattva is right over there. There she is. You can't see her because the light's going the wrong direction. But Guanyin Bodhisattva, the awakened being of great compassion, in a sutra called the Lotus Sutra, uh, gets a necklace, gets beads, and she gives them away, right? She doesn't want to take them. She, first she refuses them. The Buddha says, go ahead and take them. It's all right. So she takes them and gives them to the Buddha and also to a stupa, many jewels, Buddha. So it's interesting how generosity and this practice of having stuff pass through your hands, it comes to you and you pass it on, is a theme that goes all the way up to the highest levels of practice. And they call that uh, dana paramita, the perfection of giving, giving perfectly. Not calculating, well, if I give it, I'll get something back, you know. Or maybe uh, I won't give this because it's really nice, I'll give the other one, you know, the not so nice one. Those thoughts, that's not the perfection of giving, right? But there's a theme. Here we have 10th stage bodhisattvas. They're really close to being a Buddha already. They've almost graduated. They're at, you know, uh, brigadier general. They're on their way to becoming a... Uh, three-star, four-star, five-star general. And they're giving to the Buddha above them. We were, uh, uh, I came down, uh, came into the Buddha hall two days, two mornings ago, and Jin Chuan was sitting right where Jin Husher is sitting right there. And the time was right that the sun was coming through our eastern windows here. And this, this is, uh, we're in November now, and this is due west, that's the Golden Gate, this is east, right, that's campus, and then uh, the Sierras. And the sun, depending on the month, travels this way. So, come February, the sun is going to be there, so it rises like that. Come July, and the sun is here, and it goes like this, right? So right now, November, the sun is about there and it's slanted in and it hit those orchids. And it, because it came through our stained glass window, it hit them with blue and green and yellow light. And Jin Chuan and I were talking and we looked up in these orchids and also the Buddhas, the three Buddhas that are sitting behind me in front of all of you. They were lit up with colored light coming, slanting in from the low horizon like this. And we both went, that's beautiful. Look at that. You know, remember that? That was amazing. Because these, these are you know, spectacular orchids. Look over here. And they're white, so they reflect whatever light's on them. And it was this colored sunlight coming in. And we realized those are offerings that somebody here in our community who will be unnamed, we know who it is, offered these flowers up to the Buddha, you know? And they were so amazing that we stopped and we're like, wow, look at that, that's amazing. And we can say that about uh, offerings that, what, what, did the, what did the Buddhas, what did the, what did the devas give? Is it the devas who are offering? Yeah, they, they're so happy at hearing the Dharma, they made sincere offerings to the Buddha. What was it? Throughout the sutra, the things that the sutra praises as offerings are two kinds. One kind is stuff, things. The other kind is the giving dharma. I'll explain that. So the things they give are things that you can give. That's what I like about it, is it's not, you know, extraordinary, special, unique, devas only offerings. You don't have to belong to some, you know, platinum card club to get the stuff to make the offering of the Buddha. Uh -uh. It's incense for the nose, flowers for the eye and for the nose and for the ambiance. It's water, pure water. It's food for the tongue, water for the body. It's lamps for the eye. It's robes for the Buddha to wear, but it's just cloth. It's not fancy, you know. 
It's stuff that anybody can afford, mostly from nature. That always appealed to me because if it's fancy offerings, only the wealthy can do it, right? And they don't, they're the only ones who get the good stuff, the blessings. Not the case. And the way uh, Christianity, the way the Bible has the story of the widow's might, right? That the poor woman gives a little bit and Jesus of Nazareth says, I value her offering of a single coin, I believe, much more than the rich man who wheeled in, you know, three carts full of money because for him, that was just a write-off. That didn't show up on his taxes even. But for her, that was everything she had. Her offering is more valuable, right? Buddhism has the same story about the poor woman who came in with a little bit of oil and put it in front of the Buddha as a lamp oil compared to the rich man who brought in tanks of oil. The Buddha didn't pay attention to the rich man because he knew it wasn't sincere. But for the woman who offered everything she had for that oil, he invited her over and comforted her and talked to her. You know, So, same idea. The offerings these devas are making is stuff that you can afford. What matters is your attitude, the attitude with which you give the stuff. Why? The Buddha doesn't need your stuff. It's not the case that he likes that lamp, you know, or he wants that banana that you offered up. Uh-uh. He's got it already. He's, he's okay with it or without it. It's what you do with the mind that makes the offerings that counts. So that's the stuff. The other kinds of offerings, as it's, it's this sutra, in fact, that says, of all the kinds of offerings we can make, the offering of dharma is the highest kind, the best kind. And that always has to do with attitude. With your attitude. And it lists them. It says the things that are counted as offerings of dharma is, they say, what? Yi jiao feng xing, basically. It says, doing what the dharma tells you to do. As Master Hua would say, everybody must change. Right? Taking my bad habits and letting them go in favor of a better way to do it. Uh, having a relationship that's going sour and committing to working it out, whatever it takes, mostly listening. Right? Not waiting to be recognized as right by the other person, but. Maybe letting go of the part that has to be right. That's an attitude change. That's called offering dharma, right? That kind of stuff. You know. You know what it is. So, the, uh, the offering of dharma. They say, never retreating from that thought that you can wake up. The bodhi resolve. That's the highest kind of offering. So, there's that other kind too. And our bodhisattva is really good at giving up that kind of offering. Uh, letting go of what you wanted to do with your buddies in favor of playing with your kid on the weekend, right? You're going to give Saturday to your boy, to your daughter, whatever, whatever she wants. Eh, it might just be leaving her alone, not nagging her. Let that go. <laughs> Maybe that's what she, she wants most is mom get off her back for a day, you know. Hmm. I'm not a mom. That's easy for me to say. Hard to do if you're the mom, right? I appreciate that. But still, the giving of dharma, you know, so that's what the Bodhisattva gives with sincerity. And they're happy. The other thing is, it's happy, right? You think about Christmas, mostly we do Christmas, right? And the kids who get this stuff are happy, the parents who give this stuff are happier. Watching that look on the face of your son or daughter, and having that feeling of goodness. Mm. I've got this, uh, one of my friends is uh, Al Petaway. Uh, lives in North Carolina. And Al is, he is a uh, scholar of antiquity, particularly photographs. He was the photo editor for National Geographic for years. And so Al goes back into archival photographs from the early days of photography in the United States. And he posted one the other day, which had to do with the joy of giving, the happiness of giving. 
And it's a photograph, it must be from the 20s, or maybe from the Depression, the late 20s and 30s. And there's this little boy, little boy, and he's like, he's like this. And there's this tall man, and he's a dad. And he's got a pipe in this hand. And he's looking down kind of sternly at the young boy. And the young boy is like, and in his right hand, he's got a puppy behind his back. The dad is holding a puppy behind his back. And the boy is like waiting to find out whether he's going to get a puppy, you know. (laughs) It's just this anticipation is the the name of the... And the old, you know, this big tall guy looking, scowling down at the young boy has got this little white puppy that he's about to give to the kid, you know. And the happiness that this kid is about to receive. And the joy is the, the, the moment before, you know. And the kid is like, Got his pipe. He's going to go like that. And the kid's going to, you know, the sun will rise. And uh, so, the yes, Jerry, question. Question from where? From the internet. Okay, internet, go ahead. This is Hung Shur. Once again, I wonder how we to atheists, Dana Paramita to atheists, no different. What would be different to an atheist? Can we say Oh, your voice is just disappearing there. I have to speak up a little bit. Okay, um, the question is good except for the atheist part because I, I don't, let's see, let, let me reinterpret the question. The que- did everybody hear it? Hear what it was? It's about atheists and dana paramita. What would they get out of it? And is this a good way to bring them into the Dharma? Um, I'd like to ask the questioner, what do you think you get out of giving, out of the perfection of Dharma? And don't, don't answer that, but... Um, Dana paramita, the perfection of giving, giving that takes us all the way across, that these bodhisattvas are perfect, are practicing, is simple to explain. It's not complicated. It's giving without expecting reward. Okay? And it's giving for the joy of it. Another way to say it would be giving cleanly. Right? That's the perfection of giving. Dana paramita, perfection of giving perfectly. What does it mean? Clean. What does that mean? It means what's involved in giving. There's the gift, there's the giver, there's the receiver. And as the the classical way to describe it says, all three of those are empty, it says. So... Give an empty gift. Wait, wait till I drink my tea. I'll give you my cup. There's an empty gift, right? No, not that. It's not that you. It's empty. What it means is there's nothing. More technical jargon. There's nothing you attach to in the process of giving. The gift is not calculated on. The giver is not hoping for a reward. The receiver is not like over the moon because of the gift. Sort of. So that's what I mean when I say it's clean. There's the exchange, for sure. You give, but you don't give and then tax the gift hoping to get more back. They're going to like me more because I gave them the gift. Or because I gave them the gift, I'm going to get something big back. Right? It's a potlatch. This exchange hoping to get it back. So that's the perfection of giving. Why would an atheist not receive that if they did it? You know, it's not that I give so the Buddha likes me, and if I don't believe in the Buddha, I don't get anything. Wrong. That's not the way the Buddha. That's not the way a Buddhist would interpret Dana Paramita. So, for an atheist, it should be the same. If they do it purely, they get a hundred percent of the gift. Now, what I understand is, who can do that? Who can give purely? Nobody. 
It's like you want your kid to be happy. Okay, well, that's already not pure. Of course, normal people, you give because why? Lots of layers of meaning. Layers of stuff in there. It's not so simple for, for us, for normal people. But what the Buddha is giving us is a way to get 100% of the goodness that comes from giving. Um, if you said, why give? Well, the answer is, you get blessings. Fu bao in Chinese. All right, how do you get the blessings? Well, for example, there's all, it, I could, this could be the whole lecture tonight to go into giving, because there's lots and lots. You think about in English, in our, right now in my life, how many levels of giving are there? Well, there's getting rid of, <laughs> right? Throwing away. That's a kind of giving, isn't it? Chucking it. What do they say in Australia? How do you get rid of stuff in Australia? Anybody know? You bin it. Bin it. B-I-N. Throw it in the bin. You just bin it. Come on, I've been it already. Right? Yeah, I've been that last week. B I N N E D. You binned it. Put it in the bin. Right? We would say throw it away and put it in the garbage can or something like that. So that's one kind of giving. Chuck it away. Right? Bin it. That's one. Okay. What's another? That's kind of the lowest level. Right? What's another kind of giving? Would be like letting go of or getting rid of. Ah, I had that stuff around for so long, I finally got rid of it. You know, that's a, pretty much the same thing as throwing it away, but I, I passed it on. You know, I lightened my load. I recycled. I had a garage sale. You know, it's kind of, that's the level. What's the next? Would be something like charity. Charity with the negative, meaning somebody needed it, and I, well, I took pity on them, and I gave it to them. Chari I did some charity. I did my charity this year. I wrote a hundred dollar check to the Red Cross, you know, something like that. That's, there's not a lot of heart there. It's giving for sure. And it's better than throwing it away. All right, let's aim our, elevate our sights a little bit. What do we got now? Let's talk about giving. So, oh, uh, she was hungry. So I, I, I gave her my sandwich. Let's see. I, today I brought meatloaf and you got, uh, what? You got potato salad, so we'll swap, right? Kind of giving. I gave you my meatloaf sandwich and you gave me my, my impossible whopper, I, you know. So you give across, it's level. Giving, sharing, kind of like that, sharing. Then, what's next? Let's go up a little bit and there's, let's say, uh, it could be bestowing. We got lots of words for this, right? We got lots and lots of levels of giving. Suppose the queen bestows knighthood upon some deserving woman in England. Adele. Did Adele get knighted? Adele got a royal, what's, Adele got some sort of uh, order of the British Empire, OBE, right? Somebody can, don't, don't check, don't check. That's all right, we'll find out later. Yeah, yep, that's right. Okay, so the queen gives a, uh, gives a title to an entertainer bestows it. Well, is it up? Is it down? It's, it's not from the queen, it's down, but still it's, you know, you're more when you get it. All right, what about, uh, for example, the chancellor gives you your diploma as you cross the stage. What kind of giving is that? Well, same kind of thing. You cross the stage, your name is called, you get your diploma, you graduate it, right? Uh, a doctor gets their MD degree. A lawyer gets their jurisprudence doctor degree, JD. Okay, that's a kind of giving that's aiming up. Okay, now we're getting there. What about offering to the Sangha? Huh. What's that? Is that up? Hmm, interesting. Okay, we're still going. I'm still answering this question, right? So, you... you the Sangha is called a field of blessings. If you do those things, look, we got, here's a cup of tea. Somebody put the tea, delicious. Wets the throat. 
And they planted the field of blessings as much as I'm a field of blessings. The Sangha. Making uh, clothes. Keep you warm in the winter. Keep you cool in the summer. Keep the mosquitoes off your body. Bedding. Keep the wind off you at night. Keep the rain off you. Medicine when you're sick. And food and clothes, bedding and medicine. Right? Food when you're hungry. Those are the, called the Si Shi Gongyang, the four kinds of offerings that the Sangha can appreciate. So that's going up in a way. Because the Sangha, number one, those are necessities. If I don't have food and I'm hungry, I'm, I'm in need, right? If I'm sick and I don't have medicine, I'm in need. So that's another kind of giving. It's definitely not chucking or binning, it's not getting rid of, it's not just sharing with a friend at lunch my chips for your pretzels. It's not giving a diploma at graduation. It's another whole thing altogether. It's a kind of giving. At every step, you can do this giving cleanly and purely. Cleanly. Do you know how sure? Ah. You know, would you say that one more time? That was, I think you're right on. Yeah. So, so I've been um, thinking a bit about, um, at least in my experience, when do I come close to pure giving? And it would usually be uh, rent, how people would classify a random act of kindness, where it's not pre-calculated, it's um, sp almost spontaneous, depending um, on what's in front of you. And after that, maybe half a day later, you forget that you even did it. Um, yeah, it's kind of like that. Okay, random acts of kindness that are spontaneous. Yeah. Um, clearly, that's... Uh, think about, for example, here's one, mothers... When your child is crying, three in the morning, and they've got, they need to be changed, or they got you know, the colic, or they're hungry, and the mom, at least my mom, I don't know, your mom too, I'm sure, did not roll over and go back to sleep. That now, where somebody else will get it, you know. Let the kid cry, who cares, right? Not, right? Moms thoughtlessly get up, they do it, because that's what you do when it's your child. So where does that fall in our spectrum, right? Random acts of kindness, that's not random, but it's the same kind. Of, you just do it. You, you do it. Jin Hosher's example of seeing something that needs to be done and you spontaneously act. If we, if we had the highest, if we're going still in our, in our line of ways to give, this might be the highest kind. Because why? The bodhisattvas don't have to give. The Buddha doesn't have to receive. They do it anyway. They're sincerely making offerings to the Buddha. And why? Why are they doing that? When it's, you know, aren't they at some point, haven't you given enough? I don't think so. Because why? Even at the tenth state, these are these are devas. We're talking about the gods, right? These are not bodhisattvas. They're gods. They're still mortal. They still have births and deaths to go. Although if they're in the divine, their pure, bo pure abode, they're almost already uh, arhats. So they're, they have few more lives to go. Within the Dharma, when we give, we're giving a piece of ourselves away with every gift. So Jin Husher's spontaneous act, random act of kindness, the person who received it didn't take it as random. And invisibly, you gave away a bit of your self with every gift. So Dana Paramita, these devas are actively cultivating getting rid of the ego and the me and the mine with every gift. 
right? So that's why they're given so much, because they're still it's right in the playbook. This is completely part of the program, is with every gift you give, you're letting go of a bit of self-interest that's looking out for number one and never has enough, right? And you stack that up against the marketplace that America, ho, 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 pretty much defined where there's no limit to greed, more is better, the most is best. I mean, in, in the last 10 years, we've seen wealth concentrated in fewer and fewer and fewer and fewer and fewer hands. So now, what was the latest one? Anybody keep track? Was it down to like 13 American families now have as much wealth as 50% of the population? The lower half of income in America total equals the amount of wealth of 13 families. And just three years ago, it was like 120 families. Now it's fewer and fewer. You know, it's just we're concentrating. That's the logical outcome of the opposite of our bodhisattva's principle, which is the more you give, the less you is there, the more liberation, the freer you are, the happier you will be. Right? The opposite is, the only way to happiness is to have it all myself. Mine. Right? All mine. That that's our goal, isn't it? I mean, that's the logical, you just, mine. You know, I'm going to knock off those other 12. It's going to be one pretty soon. And interestingly enough, for quite a while, the richest man in the world was Mexican. Right? It was Carlos... What was his name? He was, what was his name? Sweet? He has, he has a one-syllable name. Who knows? Somebody got to know. What's his name? F Slim. S-L-I-M. Carlos Slim. Richest man in the world. Briefly. But then I think uh, Bezos is now the number one. And Bill Gates is going the other way. He's giving it away as fast as he can. He seems to be a pretty happy guy. Bill Gates gets happier the more he gives. Bill and Melinda. I'm, Melinda has a lot to do with that, I think. Carlos Slim, pay attention. Man. Mexican gentleman is, was and probably will be again because they're like competing. Mine! Yeah, I want it all. Oh boy, oh boy. Going the other way from principle, you know. So, anyway. The atheist, we're back to our atheist, the poor atheist. The atheist, if he practices, she practices giving, does it right, doesn't matter whether they believe in, never heard the Buddha's name, they're getting a full percent, 100% of the goodness giving away the self. That's the perfection of giving. Jinwei Shri, microphone please. We need a microphone runner who's not wearing a precept sash. There we go. All right. Because <laughs> the monks are all in full lotus. Now, maybe Connie's in full lotus too. I don't know. Yeah, there was a it's few few thoughts came about the perfection of giving. So, one we like Jean Hersha mentioned we uh, could be could be random and spontaneous act of giving, but actually also when we start the day with intention that every my step I will give. And whatever I do with my body, speech, and mind, it becomes an offering. So how I speak, what the tone of voice, how I walk, could inspire many people and could be real, pure offer. How much I consume, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, wh which kind of car I drive. <laughs> it, what kind of car do you drive? Car even, you know. Yeah. It's, so it's any small choices, what we made that moment by moment can be connected to giving. Yeah. And it's... It's, it's, yeah, it's very vast. And yeah. Be. So everybody heard Jin Wei Shu, right? If you, you can take it to where everything you do, morning, noon, and night, every step, every thought, every word, is, is done with the intention to give. Now, whether or not you actually, I mean, you can, as, as uh, uh, Marty has a favorite saying about, I think he's quoting Shakespeare, where he says, uh, when someone comes in the front door determined to do me good, I go out the back door as quickly as I can, right? 
<laughs> so you can really overdo it. And I know there's uh, where do you see it taken to a ridiculous level is uh, uh, if you have lunch with somebody from service space, <laughs> who gets the check? <laughs> They're always waiting to be the first one to sneak out. Oh, I got to go to the bathroom. They're off paying. Get there first to cover the bill, right? And then somebody else catches them. It's, I, I love it. It's wonderful. But there are, I, gr- I agree that if you have that intention and you say, mm, at le- even I want to give away the thought that I'm giving, take it into prajna paramita. You empty out that thought that you're doing good, then you're closer. But it gets esoteric in the giving. Jin Husher? Embody. Um, it's, it's just part of their nature to, to give. Yeah, not... Uh, it's not artificial. Yeah. yeah. It, for them, not, they, they can't not give. To them, it's, it's normal. That's how right, it's supposed right, to be. Right, right. And actually, uh, you know, we're talking, we're saying about bodhisattvas, right? Imagine if you heard this tonight and said, tomorrow at breakfast, I'm starting. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it for a week, starting tomorrow at breakfast. And I'm going to, even if, even if you don't translate it into action, but you notice every opportunity that came to you to give, just to observe, kind of check. Oh, look, I could have, I could have smiled instead of. Excuse me, I'll, I'll be with you in a minute. Right? You could have paid attention. You could have just listened, and taken this thing and put it away. Just to be present with your spouse, son, daughter, mom, you know, check that one. And then, you know, somebody had to do it. You could have offered to ride them, take them there. You know, all the different times during the day. And then look at your list and think, maybe I could have, I'll do one of those today. And then tomorrow, maybe two. And then the next day, try, you know, it makes for happy happy. I don't have the screen on my computer, but um, I have a favorite photograph of my childhood. I'm uh, 15 years old. Some of you have seen this picture. And I'm wearing my Ohio State University sweatshirt. Hmm. And I just got a birthday gift. And it's a golf bag. Just a bag, right? No clubs. The clubs are in the closet. But it's a golf bag. And I'm like, kind of like that because the golf bag comes with an invitation to join my father's golf foursome. I get to join my dad's golf foursome. That's called rite of passage in my family, adulthood, right? And my mother, and that's, I mean, for me, that was a big deal. I used to, my dad would come home from work, and he was a, he was a corporation lawyer, which means he argued with the labor, with AFL-CIO and the, and the uh, Jimmy Hoffa and the gang for contracts and insurance and, you know, he represented the company arguing with the lawyers, with the, the labor lawyers. And it was hard work, and you argued and fought with your words all day long. And he came home just, you know, steam <laughs> coming out of his ears like that. And I would, you know, you're always on your dad's radar, and he's on yours. And so I, he would drive into the driveway, lift the garage door, park, and I would like, and I would kind of pick him up as he got halfway to the back door. And uh, he would come in and he'd say, you want to go hit some balls? And i go, yeah. And I would go pick up our scotch plaid bag with all the golf balls with the cuts in the cover, the shag balls, they were called. And he would, you know, he would look at his golf bag and pick out like a five iron or maybe a pitching wedge or something. And, 
And he would go, he and I would walk two blocks to Ottawa Park. And it was already, he came home at 5.30 and it wasn't, the mosquitoes had come out and it was going to be dark soon. So there was nobody, we, our house was close to the third fairway and nobody was starting their round. If anybody had, they were playing on the 9th or the 10th or up to the 18th hole. So there was pretty much empty free, empty fairway. And I would take the bag and dump it out and then I'd look at what club my dad had because that's how far I would have to go. And I would go down the, free, the fairway and stand there. My dad would go, whack those golf balls. All that tension. This is Jimmy Hoffa's head. You know, you know. Here's Walter Ruther. You know. And the ball, and I would put it in the bag, you know. And he, then I would bring it back, dump it, and he'd hit another. Depending on how frustrated he was, he would go through two bags of balls. You know. And uh, so then, just before he would quit, he would say, you want to hit some? Yeah, Dad. And I would, you know, hit half a dozen balls. He'd correct my stance and stuff, and my swing. And we did this for, for years, and it didn't matter how long we were out there, I was at the other end of my dad's attention. I was bonding with my father, you know. And then, at age 15, he said, well, you know, he said, Do we t- there are three of us who always play, but we don't have that fourth guy. You want to <clears throat> you wanna join a foursome? I'm like, yeah, you know. And my mother, the thing about this photograph is she turned the camera around and took a picture of my father giving me the golf bag. And he was, my dad was a big tough guy. He was... He was an athlete, and uh, he didn't, you know, his smiles were few and far between, but he's got this smile on his face as he's giving me the golf bag and kind of promoting me to the foursome, you know. And uh, it's my favorite picture, is the joy of giving, you know. So, um, the Bodhisattva has, uh, has experienced this, and that in itself is enough. If you were to ask my dad, are you aware that you're giving away a piece of yourself? No. He says, it's my son. You know. So this is, this is a deep dive into the process of giving. What's going on? And there is a connection, mind you, between you tomorrow morning at breakfast, the attitude of opportunities to give and how much happiness you take all the way to lunch. Then it's lunchtime. And then look at those opportunities. How much happiness do you take to dinner? That's yours. If you choose to, you know, do what the devas are doing and with deep respect make offerings to the Buddha. Whoa! How wonderful is that? So, The Buddha doesn't need them. Whatever they're given, they don't need to give it. But there's this action, this transaction of my hands, this stuff to you. Or my attitude, letting go for the offering. That makes a difference. You're happy, even if you're an atheist. Okay, so far so good. The act of giving. Let's do another one. Uh, Jason. Mike, here comes the microphone. Don't go away. I'm just thinking. I'm just thinking. There's context where we shouldn't be so it, generous. W- once you got the mic, your voice went away. Okay. Now that you got the mic, your voice <laughs> should go up. So. I'm just wondering if there's context where we shouldn't be so generous. Let's say where we should not be giving. How to use the proper wisdom to know when to give and when not to give. Let's Such as, give, give me an let's example. Say in business you. setting or uh, people who's greedy. <laughs> not, it's hard to tell if they are, but you know, I, I cannot. I mean, I feel like just sort of balance or a context to know when to give and when not to give. Okay. And so I guess the question is when not to be giving or when to be less giving. I mean, yes, I'm monster in this group. You, it's going away again. I can't hear. You have to bring so, your voice all the way to my ears okay. before I can answer. Okay. So, yeah, I feel like in context of a monster or in a good yeah. community, uh, giving should be 
more generous and being more available. Um, but what about when it's not in a monastery setting, when it's in a business setting, or when people are bargaining? Yeah, uh, theoretically, there are times when you uh, don't give because your wisdom says that's not what's needed now. Um, the everything that we've been saying so far from all the different voices who've spoken um, has to do with taking charge of my attitude as I give. Um, if I'm giving and looking out at the attitude of the receiver and deciding I shouldn't give, well, theoretically, sure. There are times. Um, mostly, I want to if I'm giving, I take charge of where my mind is at that point. Good enough. You know. Um, what I proposed about breakfast tomorrow is you look at the opportunities when you could give. And you say, there's one, there's one, there's one. And suppose your giving is letting go of, letting go of, that attitude, showing your face to your, you know, the, you know, your, everybody has that look. You don't give that look to your husband. You know, the eye roll. You just don't roll your eyes, right? You don't, no matter how obnoxious he is, don't, because you know, you know, that's his button. You push that button. You don't. Just hold it, you know. That's giving, because you didn't do something, all right? And just notice, notice the opportunities. Good enough. And then if you, uh, sure, you don't want to give when it's wrong. How do you know when it's wrong? You know. Okay, next. Ready? Number two. Let's, uh, I'll give you the line again. We're going slowly here. Ready? Bukha si yi pu sa zhong. Okay, we ready? English together? Inconceivable multitudes of bodhisattvas felt great joy as they hovered in the air. And together they lit sublime incense that delighted the mind. Its scent perfumed the assembly, so all felt cleansed. Wow, e. If this were a movie, visualize that. We have bodhisattvas, inconceivable multitudes, meaning a lot of bodhisattvas, hovering in the air. <laughs> They're able to fly, obviously. Bodhisattvas in the air. And together, what do they do? They lit incense. This is incense that makes the mind happy, not just the nose. How about that? What, what would be the fragrance of that incense? It sent perfume the assembly so you felt cleaner. We have a, uh, we are, our Dharma Realm Buddhist University community has an incense maker now. And, uh, He's got a really good Instagram feed and the last couple weeks uh, every day I expect a picture of a beautiful photograph of smoke curling off an incense stick and then his words about what it is and it's getting out there. I mean, he's investigating these uh, ingredients that have Greek, uh, Latin names, you know, and... and uh, He's getting really good at, at the language of describing the smells. You know how, how wine has a whole vocabulary? People who do wine talk about the notes, you know, and, and what else? Notes and uh, for hints of what else? No, if, I know you don't drink wine. I know that. So you're not, that's okay. No, no. Notes and, yeah. And uh, so the... Uh, the world of guitar builders 
has the same problems describing a sound. <laughs> and, oh man, that's got really fat mids. <laughs> man, he's got like, that Brazilian rosewood, fat mids. Right? And everybody goes, uh huh, uh huh, yeah, yeah, fat mids, yeah. As if, you, you know, what's, what's a fat mid? Well, that would be, you want to hear a fat mid? Here we go. Yeah. Turn the mic on. Ready? All right. Here's a fat mid. There we go. You'd all agree, right? That's pr pretty fat, right? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's a chocolatey bass. That's a piercing treble. So, what, what's the problem? The problem is senses and language. So, our incense maker is doing a good job. I mean, he, uh, it gets poetic, right? The language of poetry to describe the experience of... <laughs> the action's here, but you have to bring it in language. Fascinating, to, and uh, it's a challenge. As, as somebody who writes, you know, I'm always thinking, wow, that's interesting language to describe a smell, to describe a sound, to describe a flavor, wine, you know. Uh, oh, <laughs> my experience in Holland uh, and the chocolate shop, right? I think I told this story. Uh, I was in uh, Amsterdam. No, no, uh, we were in, um, where was it? Brussels, we were in Belgium. Belgian chocolate, right? World famous. And uh, I thought, oh, okay, I'll, uh, I have an offering here. I'll, I'll get some chocolate from my mom, my sister. Bring it back, you know. Chocolate from Belgium. It's world famous. So I, I said to our, our local Chinese layman who lived in Brussels for many years, lived in Belgium, I said, could we go to a, a chocolate shop? He said, oh, uh, why? Uh, well, I want to take some chocolate back to my, my mom. Okay, sure, sure. Uh, let's see. I said, but it's probably chocolate shops everywhere, right? So he says, oh, yeah, yeah I, I know one. I said, well, I'd like to go. He said, okay, well, fine, I'll take you there. So we, we went to the, to the door, and I could see that he was not in a hurry to take me in there. He said, what are you, what are you really looking for? And I said, just, just you know, some good, good Belgian chocolate. He kind of sighed, okay, pushed the door open. And I noticed in the display window, it looked like a jewelry shop. There were these rotating presentation platters, and there were like three chocolates on the rotating platter in the front window, polished to a high gloss, you know, gold, gleaming, you know. We went in, and uh, my friend says, uh, hey, Henri, he said, uh, Je suis ici un Américain, il veut le de chocolat. Oui. And, oh, bien, bien sûr, bien, bon, bienvenue, bienvenue. And he said, uh, and uh, he looked at me, looked up and down, and I could see he, the light went out. He's like, no, this guy's not going not gonna to buy it. So uh, he said, uh, and, uh, and uh, what level of chocolate are you interested in? You know? <laughs> and, and I said, well, something nice, you know, my mom will like it, you know. And he said, uh huh, oui, ah, uh, hello, hmm. Bien sûr, okay, he said, and, uh, and what kind of mouthfeel are you hoping for? <laughs> and uh, what sort of aftertaste, you know? And uh, how much, uh, how, uh, how smooth, you know? And I'm like, maybe I'm in over my head here, <laughs> And And so my host said, oh, thank you, Henri, he said, uh, he said, I just, you know, tell your wife to come. She's meditating now, right? We'll see you next week. You know, he says, let's go. So we exited the chocolate shop, and I realized. And, and I said, what, 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 what just happened? And he said, do you know what those three chocolates? And he says, that's about $100 a bite. You know, and, and that's just the display chocolates. When you get into fancy chocolate, you know. He says, here, let's, let's go over and get 
I'll, I'll take you to the drugstore. We'll get some good chocolate for your mom. <laughs> so we did. We got, what was it, three lions or something. You know, a good standard Belgian quality, you know, grocery store chocolate. So even that was outstanding. But they considered like Nestle's. They say, no, that is floor sweepings. <laughs> Nestle's chocolate is what they sweep up after they've done the, made their chocolate, you know. So, you know, Hershey's, good bar, no, 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 no. That's not, that's not chocolate, you know. Mouthfeel, you know. So, oh, my goodness. So, anyway, yeah, so here they're lighting incense, right? And the incense, what does it do? It goes right to your mind. Incense that makes you happy and makes you feel clean. How about that? So here's our challenge for our, our Dharma Realm Buddhist University incense master in the making. He's, he's doing it. He's really doing it. He's going to make American Buddhist incense out of our own materials. Right? So cedar incense and redwood incense, and, you know. So, together they lit sublime incense that delighted the mind. Its scent perfumed the assembly so everybody felt clean. What kind of incense would that be? You know, how cool is that? Okay, that's one kind of offering. Incense. Ready? Another one. Number three. Here we go. Ready? I'll give you the line. Zi zai tian wang yu tian zhong. Wu Liang Yi Shu Zai Xu Kong. Pu San Tian Yi Gong Yang Fu. Bai Qian Wan Zhong Xu Fen uh sorry Bin Fun Xia. Okay, ready together? Kings from the Maheshvara heaven and the many devas, limitless kotis in number, soaring in space. Scattered divine raiment everywhere as offerings to the Buddha. A billion varieties descended in colorful profusion. What is it? Clothing. Clothes are an offering to the Buddha. And Master Hua would describe, um, he would say, what are the blessings of the of the heavens like. If you suppose you your next rebirth, you're not a human anymore. You you're now reborn in the heavens because of what you did while you were a human. Blessings, you held the precepts, you did good deeds. So now your next mom is a Devi. <laughs> you're heading for a, a goddess mom. And you're born in the heavens. What's it like? Master Hua would say, Oh, Better, he says, better quality. He says, clothes, what color do you want? Got it. What weight do you want? Got it. Right? What style do you want? Got it. Just like that. Think of it, it it's on you. Right? Shoes. Oh, shoes. Yeah. Manolo Blahnik. Got him. Boom. You know, Jimmy Choo. Got him. Boom. Oh, man. Right? Sandals, oof, got them. Luna sandals for running. You got them. So that's what it's like. Food, well, how do you like it? Sweet, salty, sour, bland, pungent. Got it. Just the way you want. That's what is it? It's called the blessings of the heavens. So that's no problem. Never mind folks who, because the power's been out for four days, are down to can tuna if they got it. Right? Did you all read the article? It was a really good article. Uh, Peter Fimwright is a writer for the Chronicle. I actually wrote him a letter because I liked his article so much. What was it? He went to Ukiah last week and wrote about what it was like after four days of no electricity. I think there are people in the room, I'm looking at them right now, who could tell that story, right? What was it like? PG&E forgot Ukiah. There was no emergency. They just turned the power off, right? So Peter Fimwright, bless his heart, really good writer, went to some of the apartments in the north side of town, went to a senior's home on the south side of town, 
and talked to folks who were gathered around a wood fire. They said, everybody was saying, boy, it's really nice to not have your phone. Because people talk to each other around the fire. I talked to neighbors I haven't talked to for years, you know. I still don't like them, but we were talking, you know. <laughs> and we were down to Cantuna because there wasn't anything else. We were empty, empty cupboards. There was nothing in the stores, you know. It's a really good article. He talked about how uh, an old 77 year old woman uh, was running out of oxygen and she needed oxygen to, to inflate her lungs because she, she breathed with a device, right? And so she had a little pocket generator keeping her going. And he, he got into it with her. Her name was Sylvia. And he, she said, well, I'm not afraid of dying. I'm not very far away from it. But you know, I just, not being able, I, I, don't, I don't think I want to die. It just feels really empty. And, and you know, I, I'm looking forward to being able to breathe again. You know. Turn the power on, pg and &E. You know, how much we depend on electricity in our lives. We just so that was uh, a really good article uh, about I think the Chronicle because the story was up north. They just sent all hands on deck. All the political writers were up interviewing folks in you know Sonoma County, and some of them went all the way up to Ukiah. So here we have kings from the Maheshvara heaven and the many devas, or back in the heavens here, soaring in space, limitless in number, scattering clothes. Because they're gods, they got blessings, they live it the way they want, right? Called soyi, according to your intent, stuff happens because you're a god. What do we do? We have to drive, get in the car. Do you guys order online? Do you, do you, do you shop online for clothes? Does that happen? Sometimes. You can do it, right? With a software to show you what it looks like. and You don't have to go like Ross for less or whatever you go, you know, to buy clothes. Unless it's like high, high dollar item. So we, you know, monks, pretty much going to be the same next year, you know. Our fashions are relatively conservative. <laughs> pretty modest fashion. It's been, what am I going to wear today? Uh, yeah, what am I going to wear next year? You know, pretty much the same. Speaking about electricity, I am out. Hot. It's hot. This lecture brought to you by PG&E. <laughs> Thank you, Pacific Gas and Electric. Okay, so um, as I conceive, as I consider this, when the sutra is giving us a window of a non terrestrial place, right? This is the heavens. We're up in the heavens. Devas are flying around. What does it say? Sai Shi Kong Zi Zai Tian Wang Yu Tian Zhong Wu Liang Yi Shu Sai Shi Kong I translated Zai Shi Kong as soaring in space. And this window and that window over there are pictures of Devas flying in space. And we just came back from far, far western China. If you put it on a map of America, we were out in Wyoming. Even further, we were out in Seattle, pretty much, of China, in a place called Gansu. Dunhuang is this, the town. It's where these caves full of art have existed for 14, 1600 years. And somehow, the artists envisioned Davis soaring in space. And you look at it, the physics are right. You think they're flying. And it's a wall painting. They took 
it's a, it's a sand cave, right? And they put some sort of covering, some sort of cement. Agong would know what it would be to like smooth it out, you know? And then, Guji would know how to do it. You put something on there to smooth it out. Then they troweled it really smooth. Then they put a coating on it that would take the paint. And they painted. And you can go in those caves and you can put your nose right up against the painting that was painted 1600 years ago of a deva flying through space with the physics right. Somehow the, the, the clothes are flying back just the way fabric would if it weighed a certain amount and it was coming down. How did those painters see the devas flying? Because you look at those paintings and you go, my God, that looks like somebody flying through space. Did the painters see the gods? How did they see those? To be able to reproduce them in a way that me standing here 1,600 years later is going, whoa, look at that. That's remarkable. You know, Some sort of celestial reality was happening for those artists. Don't know how. And then they captured it. They had the skill to capture it with you know, color and black ink and white space. Amazing, amazing. So when I see this having been to Dunhuang, it means something different to me now, having been there, than it did before I saw it with my own eyes. They're scattering clothes as offerings to the Buddha. Billion varieties descended in color profusion. How cool. Okay, uh, you want to try something different? Let's, let's, we have, uh, there's actually one more. I'll, I'll leave the next paragraph, the next uh, quatrain for next week because that's the lead in for the Deva Maidens. The exquisite Deva Maidens praise the Buddha with the following words. The singing by the, the women in the sky happens next. So I'll save that intro. But we'll, let's take our three quatrains today and sing them. Want to try it? We're going to use our pipe organ guitar, our Taylor 12 string. Let's see. fun part about this is the lines have no particular length. We can just stick as many words in there as you want and you, there's still room. You don't, it's not that it has to meter, okay? The, let's see, the devas from the heaven of the pure abode, Nayutas in number. Having heard the supreme practices on that stage, Danced with delight in the air, their minds filled with joy. With deep sincerity, they made offerings to the Buddha. Try that. Let's try that again. That's just, you know, fake it. <laughs> there we go. The devas from the heavens of the pure abode, Nayutas in number. Having heard the supreme practices on that stage. Basically, we're going da da di da di dum. Okay? Simple. Da dum di dum. There we go. Danced with delight. In the air, their minds filled with joy. Okay, down. With deep sincerity, they made offerings to the Buddha. Here we go. Inconceivable 
Multitudes of bodhisattvas Felt great joy as they hovered in the air And together they lit sublime incense That delighted the mind Down its scent perfumed the assembly So all felt cleansed Try the next one. Kings from the Maheshvara heaven and the many devas. Limitless kotis in number soaring in space. Scattered divine raiment everywhere as offerings to the Buddha. A billion varieties descended in colorful profusion. Isn't that fun? We're going to sing our sutra from now on. <laughs> why not? I mean, you know, why not? Okay, uh, by golly. Yes, Jerry. We do. I'll sing my answer. How's that? No, no, no. Go ahead. Microphone. <laughs> Jerry needs a microphone. Yeah, yeah. You got one? Oh, he's got one. That's the joy of pentatonic scale. Fits right in. Uh, the question from our lines. What should I do to stop feeling guilty about breaking a precept and then how should I repent? What should I do about to stop feeling guilty about breaking a precept and? And how should I repent? And how should I repent? Uh, I'm going to table that one because why? Uh, speaking in the abstract is not all that helpful and I'm not going to ask you what it was you did. Okay. Uh, if you were talking face to face and you wanted a real answer, I would. Uh, you know, so the theory is like, if you don't want to stop, don't stop. But don't try to hold the precept and stop, and not st don't try to hold the precept and not stop too. You will be unhappy. The point is, precepts are voluntary. Uh, guilt, guilt is a sign that you have affliction in your mind. Uh, you have conflicting desires. One desire is to progress on the spiritual path. Another desire is to continue with habits. Habits are strong. They're real strong. And they're, you know, there's no judgment in this. That's, that's the key, I think, about the way the Buddha does it, is the Buddha doesn't like us less if we have habits. It's not that the Buddha likes people who are pure to begin with. That's not, the Buddha 
understands he is a human being who woke up. And whether we hold precepts or break precepts is between you and you. Right? There's no standard. And we the, the five precepts for lay people, the, the precepts for lay people come in a group of five, and we usually talk about them as the five precepts. But our country, our culture is new to Buddhism. And I don't know if we have anything at all similar to the five precepts in ordinary culture. When I grew up, what do we have? New Year's resolutions. Remember New Year's resolutions? No, Dharma Master, I forgot which New Year's resolution I made. That was already nine months ago. (laughs) Get real, right? How long do you keep your New Year's resolution? You know, a week, maybe. That's good if you could do it for a week. Maybe, maybe you quit smoking. Maybe you did. A lot of people have had that experience, right? Maybe you got yourself into a group and decided you were going to go sober. Maybe you did. Hallelujah. To be able to do that, that's, that's what we're talking about in, in holding precepts, making vows. So AA, uh, or Narcotics Anonymous, are real close to what the Buddha talked about, holding precepts. But in China, for example, in Vietnam, where Buddhism has been a long time, it's like, oh, we know people who are precept holders, right? And you take the five, and you maybe you took them, and you, you do it, and that's it. In America, I think we're going to be moving closer to doing things like taking a precept when you're ready. And then maybe taking another precept ten years later, when you're ready. Um, interesting, in this theory that I'm putting out, we've been to France a lot. Master Hua first went to France in, in 19... Uh, was it 89? First time? 90. And we've been back multiple times, but you know what? The, the French came once and twice. They didn't come a third time. You know why? Life in France is good. You know. You tell me I should not drink. Why not? I have been drinking since I was five years old. You know. Uh, it's for a culture that Le bon vivre, you know, you, that's, I can't, that's not a blanket. I'm sure there will be, we have, we know young people in Paris tonight listening to this lecture who are really ready to hold the precept, who are already holding the precept. There are, but they're, guess what? They're Cambodian French, Vietnamese French, Burmese, Laotian French, right? They have a Buddhist background. But that's a start. That's good. They were born, they grew up in France, but they're, not French, like that. So, um, that is to say, um, there's a time for everything. So the questioner, if you feel guilty, that's just, that's, uh, it's good that you, that you can recognize that. How are you going to, if, for me to say, oh, you have to repent, so what? So you finally decide you're going to break your habit? Mm. Maybe you're not ready. Maybe when you took the precepts, somebody told you to. Maybe you didn't understand what the reality of facing up to a habit is. Habits are strong. You know. When we're ready, we say, no, I'm sick of being sick. I want to do what the sutra does. I want to move closer to that. Letting go of habits, you don't break habits, you let them go, you replace them with a better habit that serves you, that doesn't hurt you. But boy, oh boy, just get letting go of red meat, letting go of 
fork. Letting go of, you know, that's... You notice that I haven't been preaching vegetarian a lot from the seat. I've, I've changed... My reputation used to be, oh, I can make a vegetarian in one lecture out of young people, you know. Well, I had moms come to me and say, you ruined my happy home. My son, 13 years old, sat in your lecture. He came home and said, Mom, I'm done with meat. And I said, as long as you're eating in my kitchen, you will eat what I serve, young man. You know. And, right. What's the principle? The principle is, if I'm telling people they should stop eating meat, essentially what I'm saying is, your mom doesn't know what's best for you. Your mom doesn't love you. She's feeding you meat. Food is love. Moms love us. They're not giving you food to hurt you. They're giving you love with every bite. Right? And if you go home, Mom, I'm not eating what you feed me. That's, you know, that's not my job, is to make homes unhappy. What I can say is, hey, you 13-year-old who'd like to like who are resp- who would love to to investigate plant-based eating do this learn to cook a dish that is plant-based that didn't involve killing and tell mom you will happily cook that dish one night of the week you'll contribute some vegetarian food to the family diet can you do that take responsibility for feeding yourself and your family, and see what she says. Mom will say, well, if, sure. Let me taste it first. But yeah, you want to cook some vegetarian food to serve to your brothers and sisters and your dad? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I want to watch you, you know. And then your mom might say, well, I'll do it with you. And then she might say, well, that tasted pretty good. What else have you got, you know? Step into the food line in your family before you say, Mom, I'm not eating. You don't love me. You know. Nah, that doesn't work anymore. So I've changed my preaching about diet to a little, something a little more responsible. And we also, Berkeley Monastery doesn't have a cookbook, but we should. Today, I mentioned at lunch, man, every Saturday at noon, this building becomes Berkeley, California's best vegetarian restaurant. Can I get an amen? (laughs) Amen. Can I get a hallelujah? Can I get a bodhisvaha? There we go. That's what I'm looking for. So, yeah, boy, the food coming out of that kitchen, ooh, it's so good. It's Chinese, Vietnamese, Western, Buddhist, vegetarian, fusion cuisine. (laughs) Vegan, vegan cuisine, vegan. No, actually, I had that Impossible Whopper came out. Uh, no, that was Beyond Meat cheeseburger. There was cheese to it. So, yeah, yeah. Get the veggie cheese. So, anyway, interesting, right? That's for we who are, you know, wearing this robe, we have a bully pulpit. Be sensitive to the trouble we cause in families when we say, you know, you go home and tell your mom you're, you're done with meat. It's like, wait a minute. You know, you go home and tell your mom you're interested in nutrition. You want to find out what's the best way to eat to live a long time and be healthy. And you appreciate what she goes through feeding you. Right? That's closer to it. Anyway. So, that's a long answer to the question uh, about how should you repent now that you've broken a precept. Um, bow the great compassion, repentance. And then check your meters. How do you feel? And when you're ready, if you really, really, really are ready, consider giving up that habit and replacing it with a better habit that doesn't make you feel guilty. So that's my answer. And I think that's a little closer to, you know, say a hundred Hail Marys, a hundred Our Fathers, and you're clean. Thank you, Father. Forgive me, Father, I have sinned. Like, the priest takes it on for you. That's profoundly 
flying in the face of cause and effect. So, how many? That is it. That's not what they expected to hear. I'm sure. Um, how many people are listening tonight, Jerry? Seventy on YouTube. Hey, that's a new high. How about that? Thirty-one from China. Got thirty-two from China. We broke a hundred. That's good. Okay, tomorrow is all-day Buddha recitation. Um, we walk starting from 7.30 and uh, go until 4.30. And people are welcome to join, reciting the Buddha's name. too high. to you from Saginaw, Michigan. Um, so that's tomorrow. Then we have uh, a full week of our regular events, including uh, Professor Verhoeven's uh, Friday night Avatamsaka Sutra lecture on the ninth chapter. That's our Vietnamese translator. I'm hearing Go Hong's voice. Yeah, it's uh, that uh, Thursday night, uh, Friday night lecture is quite wonderful. Um, Marty is uh, explaining a lot of the basics of a lot of Buddhism 101, right? Buddhism for beginners, and that's also uh, archived on YouTube. So if you go to Dharma Realm Live. You can listen in to last week's lecture and they're always entertaining. It's always a chance to tune in, to learn new approaches to familiar ideas. Tomorrow, up at Dharma Rome Buddhist University, I'll be explaining, um, I'll be telling stories about Master Hua. Um, do you know, any, is, is there a title to that or what, what do they call it? Reflections or something? Is that, do you have it, you want to read it? Oh, it's a legacy club, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay, uh, we need a microphone over here. The Master, Master Hua Fan Club. I think there might be an online broadcast as well. I don't know if that's, is that on the poster, the online? No, no. It's not online, no. I think it. Oh, it, it will be online. It will oh. be, there will be an online Well, hey, broadcast. you all can listen in. So if you want to, you need to, I don't know how you would get the link. How would you get there? Um, um, it's uh, one of some of the students club. I don't know if there's an email. If you can, if you were interested, maybe you can write your, go to the BBM contact form on Berkeley Monastery webpage, and if you if you ask about the web the, the lecture, I'll forward your email to the organizers. So there's a BBM contact form on the BerkeleyMonastery.org webpage. Please go there. You all got that? Not okay. Uh. BerkeleyMonastery.org. That's our website. 
berkeleymonastery.org, there's a contact form. Say contact. And that you send it to that email. Send your email to that email. And we'll forward it over to whoever has got their phone operating in the room at DRBU. And they can decide whether they want to pay attention to you or not. <laughs> also, Tuesday, we have Bai Geary coming. First yes. Tuesday. Right. I believe Ajahn Pasano will be coming to, sh to speak. He's back in uh, California. Ajahn Pasano, the former co-abbot of Abba Giri, is coming here on Tuesday night. You come at 5 o'clock, you can drink tea with him and hear his stories. Uh, he has recently retired from abbot ship and is enjoying being able to travel around the world and uh, has lots of stories to tell. Then there'll be... I am not sure, but I think that we change our time, right, in this night? This oh, is, it, is that right? Daylight savings? Yeah. Tomorrow? Is it spring ahead, fall behind? So you get an extra hour. We get to sleep an hour longer. So don't come at uh, 6 o'clock for <laughs> our Buddha recitation. Uh, or for, for meditation. Yeah, you can, you can reach meditation. Yeah. So what that means, it's usually about 2 a.m. when they switch them, right? So... You want to set your watch or your clock back when you get home tonight and uh, enjoy an extra hour to do what you wish, to meditate. You can meditate a little longer. All right, by golly. I don't have my slide or I would let you hear how this sounds. This is a uh, mule resonator guitar. <laughs> Hello? Metal, weighs eight pounds. Beautiful guitar. So, with that in mind, uh, let us. We're retrograde Mercury, anybody keeping track? As of two days ago. Turn to the back of your songbook, this guy, and send out your wishes. I want to appreciate everybody who came tonight. How, the guys' side is just full of guys. Look at more than the women's side. That's, that's rare. Let's all room together next semester. What do you say? That's great. So you all can contemplate what kind of shoes you'd wear in the heavens. You think? Boots, maybe? No? No? What kind of shoes do Davies wear? Cloud hoppers, right? Cloud hoppers. Here we go. that wish, how you want to send out your merit, send your mind out like a cell phone tower, as far as you can go. May every living be our minds as one and radiant with light. Share the fruits of peace, lower, huh? With hearts of goodness, luminous and bright. If people hear and see how hands and hearts can find in giving unity, may our minds away to great compassion, wisdom, and to joy. May kindness find reward. May all who sorrow leave their Boundless light, dispel the darkness of their endless night. Because our hearts are one, 
This world of pain turns into paradise. May all become compassionate and wise. May all become compassionate and wise. May all become compassionate and wise. So, all right, have a week full of blessings and contemplate that giving, right? Just look at your world and think, hmm, there's, ah, that was a perfect chance to give. Maybe, maybe I'll try it next time. Yeah, yeah. And 祝人是快乐之本, said the Chinese. Helping others is really the source of happiness. Deep wisdom. See you all next week. Bow in respect to the Venerable Master.